my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that curse bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all
Good morning. Thank you for joining us on YouTube and Facebook Live today. Feel free to drop us a note and say hello in the Facebook chat if you're online there and we would love to say hi. We'll be looking at the end of Luke chapter 10 this weekend in our series called The Doctor is in Discipleship in Luke. This short story in today's text is always a challenge and a comfort to me, and I believe that you will find the message from Bjorn to be both today as we look at this interaction between Jesus and his friends Mary and Martha. We are back in the YMCA for our in-person worship service, which will continue on Saturdays at 4 p.m. And the Y is completely closed on Sundays right now, so we thought we would try Saturdays for the month of October. If you do come to our indoor service, we will follow MDH guidelines and do our part to keep everyone safe and healthy. We are social distancing across the gym and face masks are required as we move back indoors. We also have a sign-in process at the welcome table like you're seeing at restaurants and other businesses. So if contact tracing would become necessary, we can easily do that. Child care will also be available in the community room for those who are interested. Our kids ministry will continue to be a virtual experience and you can continue to watch those at home. They're posted on our website and social media pages by 7 a.m. on Saturdays. And each week, student ministry for middle and high school students will meet um, weather permitting outside during the month of October. And if we need to, we can move into the gym as well. All students can save the date for our fall party, which is going to be in the Hilliers backyard on October 25th from 3.30 to 6. A fun fall serving opportunity coming up is Rake the Town on Saturday morning, October 31st. And we're gonna be raking leaves to help people in our community. You can sign up for that on our website. If you or someone you know could use help with your yard this fall, please let us know that as well. I also wanna tell you about an exciting global serving opportunity through our partnership with Hope Enterprises in Ethiopia. We have partnered with Rogi School for the past several years and are so grateful for many of you who continue to sponsor a child year after year. If you are interested in starting a sponsorship, it is really simple. For $30 per month or $360 per year, so about a dollar a day, you will provide a child with a Christian-based education, clothing, a nutritionally balanced diet, and basic instruction and counseling for the parents. You will also receive a picture of your sponsored child, some basic information about them, and the opportunity to co correspond with your sponsored child if you desire. We have a link to donate posted on our website at thewhychurch.org backslash rogi. And you can also find out more information about the school there and see pictures from visits that Y Church members have made to the school in past years. Thank you so much for considering this partnership. And if you have any questions at all, please contact info at thewhychurch.org. And if you would like to partner but can't do so financially at this time, the best ways to support this ministry is by praying for the kids who attend. Prayer is also a key, such a key part of our life together, and we would love to pray specifically for you in any way that we can. So whether it's a praise report or prayer request, feel free to email that to prayer at the whychurch.org or call 763-250-9504 for pastoral care. We would love to hear from you and pray for you. Finally, giving is also part of our weekly worship time as we have the opportunity to give a portion of what God has given us back to him. There are a few different ways you can do that. You can go on our website and go to the whychurch.org slash egiving and give there. You can use mobile giving by simply using your phone to text YGIVE to 77977. And you can mail your offering in as well to the address that's there on the screen. We are so grateful for your generosity as we carry out ministry together. And now we invite you to join in as we worship God through song. And then we will hear our story read from our Beginner's Bible. With this heart open wide. From the depths, from the heights, I will bring a song. 
sacrifice. With these hands lifted high, hear my song, hear my cry, I will bring the sacrifice.
brother Lazarus were friends with Jesus. One day Jesus came over to visit. Mary sat at his feet and listened to him for a long time. Meanwhile, Martha was busy cooking and cleaning. There was so much to do. The longer Mary listened to Jesus, the madder Martha got. She said, I'm busy in the kitchen while Mary is doing nothing. Jesus, please tell my sister to help me, Martha whined. Martha, Martha, said Jesus, you should not be upset. Mary has chosen what is better. She's listening to me. Well, good morning, everyone. This is Bjorn. Great to be with you in worship as we gather online. I want to thank Bella for reading scripture for us from the Beginner's Bible. Uh, it's so good to be together in whatever way we can and to open the word together I want to share too some exciting news from this weekend. You know, we're gathering in different ways and, and taking ministry on the road. And so I wanted to share this picture of baptism that we celebrated uh, at the Pothen House as we celebrated Kylie's baptism. So really meaningful to be together just in a smaller group of family and to celebrate God's work in Kylie's life through baptism. Uh, here we now want to share our kids' blessing. And so this is a time in our worship service to speak blessing and life over the kids that God has placed into our lives. Uh, you can speak this blessing over anybody who comes to mind. So it could be a little one next to you there in the living room, or it might be your spouse or, you know, someone who is uh, a long ways away from home. Uh, but you can speak this blessing from a distance. We're going to personalize it. You'll see a blank line in, in this passage, uh, which we've turned into a blessing from Ephesians 4. And that's where you just drop in that name as we bless um, kids and people of all ages together. So here we go. Ephesians 4, let's say these words together. Be kind and compassionate to others. May you forgive others just as in Christ God forgave you. Amen. Great blessing to share. Uh, table question time. We are going to ask this. I just started thinking about this with my own kids and um, taking walks through the neighborhood and the weather is certainly turning into later fall, but that is this. What's the best treat to get when you are out trick-or-treating? Would love to have you answer that question either with those you're, you're watching with this morning or in the chat window. You can drop in your answers. Bonus points if you pick Reese's because that would be my favorite, but um, let's toss that around for a couple minutes and then we're going to turn to scripture and we'll hear that reading from Luke 10 from Greg Lambach.
As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Well, thanks, Greg, for reading scripture for us this morning. I've been thinking to myself, it is so fitting that Greg would be reading this scripture passage that centers on hospitality. And the reason I say that is because I have experienced firsthand uh, the hospitality of Greg and his wife, Donna, as I have visited their house. They don't live too far away from us. And I remember being over at their house one afternoon for coffee and conversation and the most amazing orange scones, these homemade scones that Donna made were just incredible. And so they welcomed me into their home. It's just a great picture of hospitality. I got to meet their pet canary and then to sit at their table and enjoy their company. Uh, this was long before COVID, you know, back when we remember going over to people's houses and you didn't have to think about masks or sitting six feet apart. But I bet you remember what it looks like to enjoy or to offer hospitality to someone. Uh, if someone comes over to your place, uh, you meet them at the door and, and you take their jacket and hang it up and, and you ask them, what would they like to drink? Show them a, a place in your living room or maybe the weather's good and you're out on the back deck where where they can sit down. A simple setting of hospitality is what we have for us today in this passage. But the lesson of this short passage is so profound for all of us who have decided to follow Jesus. And I want to be really open with you as we uh, open these pages of scripture that the message of this story is one that I find particularly challenging for me. Uh, I so identify with Martha in this passage. It's almost like default mode in my life. And it has been so good for me in my study of scripture this week to just come under the Lord's correction. The Bible says the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. And I'm so grateful that he would convict and prompt and prod me uh, in, in, in not leave me the way that he found me. And, and I hope that uh, you hear my heart in that as I share with you what the Lord has first impressed upon me from my own life. The passage today is just a few verses here at the tail end of chapter 10. And Luke's gospel is the only gospel that gives us this story. It's these stories that are unique to Luke that have shaped our fall message series that we've called The Doctor is In, Discipleship in Luke. And even though it's the small little story and it could appear to stand on its own, uh, we would always do well to ask in reading scripture, okay, what comes right before and what comes right after this passage? And is there an important connection? I think there is here, and we would do well to take note of that before we, before we begin with the details of the story. Luke 10 is really quite the chapter. It begins with what we studied last week and the sending out of the 72. So just a quick recap. In chapter 9, Jesus had, had sent out his 12 disciples, and then we get into chapter 10, and Jesus sends out 72 more. And their job is to go ahead to the towns and villages along the way and to prepare people to meet Jesus when he arrives. And when the 72 come back then from those little mission trips, they come back to Jesus, and what do they say to him? They say, essentially, Lord, look what we've done. It says in the passage, even the demons submit to us in your name. Lord, look what we can do. Then the next story is right in the middle of Luke 10, and it's the story of the Good Samaritan. And how does that one begin? It begins by someone standing up and saying to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Just, just tell me what to do, Jesus. And so we see this emphasis that is all on activity. And if there is a default mode in our spiritual life, it is often this, that we measure ourselves by what we have done. 
almost like a kid running up with a report card uh, and saying to Jesus, look, look what I've done. Look at how hard I've tried and all the things I've accomplished. Look at all these top grades. And if we have not had top grades, then it's almost like we, we cower. We, we wouldn't run up to Jesus and show him our, our report card uh, because we're ashamed of it. And so we would maybe even actively wonder, well, what can I do to inherit eternal life? You know, I really botched up the first half of my life. And, and so what do I have to do now? I, uh, can, I, can I accomplish more good things that would out, outweigh the bad things? What must I do? And in a sense, this so characterizes uh, the kind of uh, agnostic spirituality that is common in our country and culture nowadays. Uh, that, that someone would say, well, if I just try my best to do the right thing, uh, maybe I can tip the scales. If I'm just a, ni a nice enough person, I just have to give it an honest try, and then God or whoever it is will be satisfied, I think, with what I have done. Stacked on these stories about doing, we have this story that is all about being. Martha is doing, Mary is sitting. Martha is doing, Mary, by contrast, is listening. And then isn't it interesting to see what happens right after this story? We go into Luke 11, where Jesus is teaching his disciples not about doing, but about depending on God in prayer. And he teaches them the Lord's Prayer. We can get so carried away in our doing that we miss the guest who is just waiting for us to spend time with him. Now, one final word about this, and, and then we'll look at the actual verses. This story, uh, I want you to understand, is not about the contemplative life versus the active like uh, life, as if it's this really black and white picture of two extremes. The message today is not to stop doing all this stuff and just turn into a mystic or a monk or a nun. That would be to misunderstand the passage. This is a passage about priority and how the right order of priorities shapes both your being and your doing. We're going to say more about that later. For now, let's get into this story and watch how it unfolds. I hope you have your Bible there in front of you, um, paper Bible or on your phone. Turn to Luke 10. And here we see Jesus and his disciples are traveling in verse 38 as the story begins. And it says, Jesus arrives at this unnamed village at the home of Martha and Mary. Now, we know a few things from other parts of Scripture that fill in the details uh, that aren't named here necessarily. The village is Bethany, which was just over the Mount of Olives, about two miles east of the city of Jerusalem. And this family that lived there was very familiar to Jesus. Two sisters and a brother, Martha, Mary, and their brother, Lazarus. And I wonder if you have ever thought about this, if, if Jesus had, you know, like friends, ordinary friends, right? We know that he had disciples and followers, but what about friends? I think that this trio really answers that question. I mean, yes, they are believers in Jesus and they're disciples in that sense, but in these three, we see, see a true portrait of friendship that Jesus enjoyed with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. In fact, when Lazarus dies in John chapter 11, we see Jesus weeping at the tomb. He is just so overcome um, with sorrow for his friends and to see the pain of death that these two sisters are experiencing, even though he knows that he is about to raise Lazarus from the dead. It's an amazing story. I encourage you to read John chapter 11 and that story as a compliment to this one today. But understand this in Luke 10, that Jesus is visiting his friends. And it would appear that perhaps Martha there is the oldest of those three siblings. It says that she, is, um, she has opened her home to Jesus, is how it reads in the passage, as if she's the one in charge. And Mary, by way of contrast, is simply introduced as Martha's sister. Now, when we consider Mary, we really should pay attention to some of these little nuances. Have you ever been introduced as so-and-so's brother or sister? I mean, especially younger siblings. You can relate to this, right? 
where, you, where you're introduced as your older brother or sister's sibling. And this can follow someone all the way into adulthood, where they're in a sense kind of under the shadow of their bigger sibling. That's Mary. She has even a, a common name in their time and place in, in the Jewish world. Mary was a very common name. We see it all over scripture. Nothing special. And she is introduced then simply as Martha's sister. Here she is. Furthermore, in the story, we have essentially three characters. And who is the one that never speaks? It's Mary. Mary doesn't say a word in this whole passage, even though we're about to learn something vitally important from her. And I bet you can think of someone in your life where you have learned volumes by their example. I mean, they didn't even have to say that much. You just watched their life and and that said everything that you needed to know. You learned from their example. And, and that's Mary. Her posture says everything in this passage. Verse 39 says, Martha had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now to sit at someone's feet in their culture was a sign of submission. Like Mary has recognized who is in the room, that he is the Lord. And in the presence of the Lord, there is only one place that you want to be, and that is sitting at his feet. This also happens to be the posture of discipleship. In their culture, a, a rabbi would teach uh, from, from a chair, would teach seated, and then the disciples of that rabbi would gather around at their feet and listen and learn. It almost reminds me of like a, a kindergarten classroom where the teacher might have a really good book to read and then uh, is seated in the chair and all the little students, the kindergartners, are on the carpet there ready to listen. Mary has sought out the posture of a disciple. And the Greek here makes it clear that this was her initiative. The exact verb that's used there for sat means she sat herself beside. So it was not like she was seated in the living room and then Jesus arrived and, and he came in and, and plopped down in a chair beside her. No, the, the verb indicates that it was Mary who sat herself beside Jesus. She saw the opportunity and she took a disciple's posture. And the fact that Mary, a woman, would do something like this is absolutely stunning. And we can easily miss this because our culture doesn't operate this way. But, but in the ancient Jewish world, this was unthinkable that Mary, a woman, would sit at Jesus' feet as a disciple. Uh, if anyone in the story should be censured and corrected, it would be Mary on this point. She should be up and doing exactly what we see Martha doing, serving the food, offering hospitality, and tending to the home. The role of women in their culture, in their time, was centered on domestic duty. Their role was to support the religious instruction of the men and never even think that they would engage on it as their own study. But that is not the way of discipleship. Jesus calls each one of us to know him and to follow him. Men, women, young people, and children. So Mary sees the opportunity at Jesus' feet. And then what did she do there? It's, it's the second half of the verse. She listened to what he was saying. In the Gospel of Luke, to listen to the word was to join the road of, of discipleship, to listen to the word of the Lord. And I could show you several examples of where this happens in Scripture, none of them closer than Luke 11, where we see a woman from the crowd yells out to Jesus and says, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. So let me paraphrase. She is saying, blessed is the woman who raised such a son, who did such an awesome job, who got such good grades on her spiritual report card. And what does Jesus say in response? He says, no, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. To listen to the word is to be on the road of discipleship. And Mary doesn't want to miss her turn. Meanwhile, verse 40, 
It says, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Some people see in Martha the classic type A personality, proactive, responsible, ambitious, rigidly organized, concerned with time management. Some of you see yourselves in this, some of you see your spouse or one of your kids. But at some level, I think uh, this is something we can all relate to. Martha was distracted by all the stuff there was to do. This is the only place in all of the New Testament where this Greek word is used. It's the word perispao. It's translated here distracted. And its literal meaning is to be pulled away by something. And not just pulled away, but to be overburdened by it. And I want to ask you now, what for you are those classic places in your life uh, where you can be distracted? In your own life, what are the things that tend to pull you away from being with the Lord and listening to his word? What are the things for you that, that would overburden you and keep you busy? Martha was distracted by all the preparations. The Greek word that's used there is the word diakonia. We get the word deacon from that. Uh, it's the word for ministry or service is what's translated as preparations. And it occurs to me that sometimes our very ministry, our commitment to serve, can get in the way of our being with Jesus. The activity of ministry, the work of the church, the way that you serve can actually distract you from the more important task of listening to the Word of God. A, a church can become full of busybodies, people who are uh, there with a deep sense of duty, but who are ultimately out of touch with the Lord who we say that we're serving. And that is a dangerous place for a church to be, where people are serving and serving and serving, but no one is spiritually growing. And this is coming from the Gospel of Luke, where Luke writes so often of the importance of serving. The story of the Good Samaritan that we mentioned comes right before this, this passage. And, and that story ends with Jesus saying, go and do likewise. But here we're reminded, do not go at the expense of hearing the word. Our very best serving flows out of our listening. Daryl Bach um, writes often on, on the book of Luke, and he says, service of the hand cannot supersede service with the ear, since the ear guides the heart and the hand. So it starts here with listening. When we sit at the feet of Jesus and just listen to what he says, that is fuel for a life of true service. Martha, on the other hand, she seems to be running on empty calories. She is laboring for the Lord at the expense of his word. All those preparations, all those things to do, and where do they lead Martha? First to distraction, and then to irritation. And I want you to imagine the scene in that home that day. The longer Mary sits, the more irritated Martha gets. There's this very real feel to the story today, uh, especially if you grew up with siblings in your household. You can just picture this, right? That, that Martha is starting to simmer as she watches her sister Mary just sit there while she does all the work. You can picture Martha hustling in and out of the kitchen and, and bringing beverages to people and, and, and the dishes are piling up in the kitchen. She's cooking up a storm and getting the, real, the meal ready. And when Martha is ever out there in the living room, I picture her looking at Mary. And if looks could kill, boy, Mary would be in trouble at this point. But, but Mary seems oblivious. She doesn't even notice. She's just sitting there listening to Jesus. And the more this goes on, the matter Martha gets. And pretty soon, you can hear the dishes are clanking a little bit louder in the kitchen. You know this, right, from your own house? I mean, it's almost like dishes are being set down on the table with a little extra oomph, and cupboard drawers are being slammed with a little extra force. And, and maybe one of the other disciples says, Martha, uh, are you okay? And she says, yeah, I'm fine. But Martha is not fine. Right? We, can, we can see these scenes happening in our own homes, can't we? She's not fine. She is, she is cooking on the inside. She is exasperated 
and so infuriated that finally she marches into the living room and says, with Mary sitting right there, says to Jesus, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Lord, don't you care? That's how she starts. And we recognize that from somewhere else, don't we? It's in Mark chapter 4 with the disciples in the boat. And they're waking up Jesus in the middle of a storm saying, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care, Jesus? And this gives voice to what we can feel. We, we can feel awfully alone sometimes, either because the threat of what lies around us is so severe, or because we have isolated ourselves from hearing the master's voice. And for Martha, it's the latter. She's distracted, she's overburdened, and now she is playing the martyr saying, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? And then comes the demand, tell her to help me. Isn't that interesting that Martha calls Jesus Lord, but who is telling who what to do here? Martha has her plans made up in her mind. She is not here to listen. She is busy. She's got a to-do list a mile long, and she's under a certain level of pressure that apparently no one else in the house seems to appreciate. And she's tried to bottle it up, but now she just loses her composure and uncorks uh, with these words that she says to Jesus. And I imagine the house got real quiet real fast. Uh, when, when, when Martha erupts, I bet you could have just after that cut the tension with a knife. But Jesus, he looks at Martha and his eyes are full of compassion. And he says to her, Martha, Martha. When Jesus says something twice, you want to pay attention, especially when it's your name. These are words of affection. Like when he says in Luke 13, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Or when he says, Simon, Simon, in Luke 22. Here he says, Martha, Martha. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are, in, are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Some of you today, perhaps, perhaps many of us, are worried and upset about many things. Frankly, there are many things to be worried and upset about. You don't have to look around long to see that. But these things uh, will skew your priorities. They will distract your focus. And they will consume your time and your energy until all of your time and your energy are spent. Jesus says, Martha, you don't need this stuff right now. You just really need one thing, and that is to sit at my feet and listen to my voice. Everything else, Martha, it's, it just can wait right now. It will find its place. What Jesus says is Mary has chosen what is better. And, and when he says that, he's using the, actually the language of eating a meal. The actual wording says Mary has chosen the good portion. Have you ever noticed how kids will automatically pick the good portion when presented with some options. Whether it's a candy bar that's cut in half or it's something at the dinner table, kids just know. And, and, and Mary, like a kid, will, will arrive here at the table in a sense and pick the best option. Except the meal is not food for the body, it's spiritual food. Which is why Jesus says, it will not be taken away from her. My brother-in-law, Johannes, passed away earlier this year and uh, he once told me years ago how important it was for him to have a spiritual breakfast each morning and um, many of you know my wife Esther immigrated from Germany so uh, Johannes all of her family over in Germany he was saying this in German and he, he talked about you can practice your high school German he called it geistlich frühstücken uh, to have a spiritual breakfast and what he meant was for him to begin each day sitting at the Lord's feet, hearing his word. In other words, to, to spend time in scripture, 
and to be with the Lord in prayer. Johannes was telling me that he couldn't figure out how he would face each day without first having breakfast with the Lord. And that's what this passage is about. Uh, not downplaying how we serve others. It is not commending some kind of, of ascetic life uh, that is all about meditation, but it's about finding our priorities to see the opportunity that we have with Jesus to sit at his feet and to listen to his voice, to hear his word. And I want to ask you here at the close of the message today, if you are ready to receive his correction, if he is speaking these words to you. Jesus here is incredibly clear, uncompromising, and yet so full of affection for you. Uh, remember, Scripture says the Lord disciplines those that he loves. So he comes and he says, Martha, Martha, Bjorn, Bjorn, Greg, Greg. And if he is saying your name, and he is, then you don't want to miss it. I want to challenge you to try something in response to the message today. Uh, I want you to see if you can pick one thing that you are supposed to do today or tomorrow at the latest, something that is on your to-do list. Um, you know you've got to get it done. You want to get it done. And I want you to simply replace it in that moment by taking time in scripture and in prayer. And I want, to, I want you to just do it as an experiment and see what happens when you will turn to the word um, and you might turn to Luke or, or any place in scripture that the Lord leads you, but Luke would be a great place. Turn there and, and listen to the Lord and bring him your worries and the things that you're upset about. Bring those to him in prayer and see what will happen. See if, see if he will not return to you that time that you spend there. And so much more when you choose the good portion and you set your priorities in order. Let's bow together in prayer. And, and today as I pray for us, uh, I want to lean on words from Psalm 119 that I think echo a lot of what we've heard today. So let's, let's pray together. You are my portion, Lord. And I desire to obey your word. I, I desire to seek your face with all my heart and that you would be gracious to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways and I have turned my steps to your statutes. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. The earth is filled with your love, Lord. And I ask you to teach me your decrees. For Jesus' sake, and in his name we pray. Amen. Well, let's sing one last song together, and then I'll be back to close out our worship time.
Well, a chapter later is when Jesus in Luke 11 teaches his disciples how to depend on God in prayer. And he teaches them the Lord's Prayer. That's the prayer that I invite you to pray out loud with me wherever you are as you listen to this message and this worship service. Uh, let's join our voices together as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, thanks again for being with us for worship this morning. I hope this finds you well. I hope that our time here has nourished you in spirit. As uh, we head into the later part of October here, remember that we have our in-person worship opportunity at the YMCA in the gym on Saturdays at four o'clock. Saturdays at four, we social distance, uh, we mask up because uh, we're inside the YMCA, but we'd love to see you there as you're able to and as you feel comfortable. Otherwise, we always have this Sunday 9.30 option, our online service and uh, are, are joined here together as well and so grateful for it. As you head into uh, the rest of your Sunday and a new week ahead, we wanna speak the Lord's blessing over one another. These are words of scripture that we close our time with. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and may he give you his peace, amen. Great to be with you again. We'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.